just two days before she was served with a congressional subpoena. Now, on March 2nd, pay close to the attention to the timeline, 2015, the same day the world first found out about Clinton's use of a private email server when she was Secretary of State, Clinton's campaign manager, John Podesta, and her campaign manager, Robbie Mook, they exchanged emails about how they were completely caught off guard by the discovery. And then 30 minutes later, Podesta sent this email to top Clinton aide Cheryl Mills, quote, we're going to have to dump all those emails, so better to do it now sooner than later. Our own Jennifer Griffin asked the Clinton campaign about the email, and they are claiming that dump meant to release. Okay, if that's the case, then why didn't Podesta just say release instead of dump? And if we're going to be totally honest here, can you really take the Clinton campaign at their word about anything or any of this? After all, Hillary Clinton has changed her story about the use of a private server so many times. How can you believe any of this? Watch this. The laws and regulations in effect when I was Secretary of State allowed me to use my email for work. That is undisputed. It clearly wasn't the best choice. Um, and I take responsibility for that decision. I thought it would be easier to carry just one device for my work and for my personal emails instead of two. iPhone or Android? <laughs> iPhone. Okay, in full disclosure, BlackBerry and a BlackBerry. I have a, a, a you know, a, an iPad, a mini iPad, an iPhone, and a BlackBerry. I believe I have met all of my responsibilities, and the server um, will remain uh, private. In order to be as cooperative as possible, we have turned over the server. They can do whatever they want to with the server. I am confident that I never sent nor received any information that was classified at the time it was sent and received. So that leaves the 100 out of 30,000 emails that Director Comey testified uh, contain classified information. I did not receive anything that was marked as classified. Director Comey said that only three out of 30,000 had anything resembling classified markers. You were the official in charge. Did you like the server? What, like with a cloth or something? No. Well, no. We turned over everything that was work-related, every single thing. Uh, no, they didn't turn over everything. And by the way, it wasn't with a cloth. It was with bleach bit. Basically, they acid washed it. Now, for a minute, I know just for a minute, let's put aside Hillary Clinton's problem with telling the truth. Now, if the Clinton campaign really wants you to believe by saying dump, they meant release, then why did they eventually delete 33,000 of those emails? And if they were emailing about transparency and making the emails public, then why on March 4th, the same day the Benghazi Select Committee served Hillary Clinton a subpoena to preserve all emails related to the terror attack, why then did Podesta write this to Cheryl Mills, quote, think we should hold emails to and from the President of the United States? And why just a few days later, March 7th, after President Obama said he first learned about the server from journalists, from the news, why did Cheryl Mills email this, quote, we need to clean this up. He has emails from her, and they don't say state.gov. Now, after being blindsided by the discovery of the private email server, it sounds like the campaign was quickly realizing how big a problem they had on their hands, which may then explain what happened next. According to the FBI's report on Clinton's server, just weeks later, on March 25th, Bill Clinton's staff, including Cheryl Mills, they held a conference call with Platte Rivers Networks. Remember, they're the IT company. They were the server company that had the server in a bathroom closet that helped to manage the private server. Well, on the same day that conference call took place, through March 31st, an employee of the company used bleach bit to permanently delete the 33,000 emails. Now, according to the FBI, the Platte Rivers Network employee, he claims he was told to destroy the emails in December of 2014, but he told investigators the reason he waited was because he simply forgot to do it. Now, the timing of all of this is beyond questionable, especially given the fact that on March 9th, three weeks before the emails were permanently released, Platte Rivers Network was notified of a congressional order to preserve all of Clinton's records. The employee at the center of all of this admitted to the FBI that he knew of the order, but he did it anyway. 
Joining us now with reaction, the author of Treason, former Speaker of the House, Fox News contributor Newt Gingrich. You know, Mr. Speaker, I'm a humble talk show host. We met in 1990. Um, I've known you all these years. You've become a dear friend, a close friend, a mentor. Um, I admire you a lot. I know you changed the country. You were one of two successful conservative movements that changed the country for the better. Why is Sean Hannity the only one laying out the case that should be in the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Times, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC? Why is nobody covering this? Well, we do know part of the answer. They're colluding with the Clinton campaign. Why are they not covering this? Well, I, th I think the dam is starting to break a little bit. Uh, you know, they hate the idea of Donald Trump winning. Uh, he is, he's, an, he's an assault on the entire establishment. Uh, they are desperate for Hillary to win, and they're trying to carry her to the finish line, no matter how corrupt, how embarrassing, how difficult. Uh, but every day it gets heavier and gets harder. Uh, as I listen to you go through that list, by the way, um, I was asking John Heinz to, to check to make sure I was right. There were 43 people in Watergate who were either indicted, tried, or convicted. Uh, and I say that because as you watch more and more of this stuff, I don't see how John Podesta is going to stay out of legal trouble. I don't see how Cheryl Mills is going to stay out of legal trouble. Huma Abedin, uh, a lot of those secondary players, the IT guy. I mean, this is not just about Hillary Clinton. This is a large group of people who are being carried into behavior, which is illegal. Uh, much of it involves overt criminality. Uh, certainly Doug Band is, I think, at risk uh, of being part of a RICO organized crime uh, trial. Uh, so you go down that list. I think there are a lot of people here who are going to get, from, despite everything that Attorney General Lynch has done to block it, uh, and it's quite clear now that she has been the primary blocking point, and the people she appointed when she was in the uh, Brooklyn office of the U.S. Attorney, uh, as Andy McCarthy has pointed out in a new column coming up tomorrow morning, uh, that, that she's really at the heart of the effort to protect Hillary Clinton from her own criminal behavior. Why is this so important? In other words, I guess in Watergate, like in this case, the cover-up is worse than the crime. But she put a private email server in play. She knew the rules. She even advised everybody working at the State Department not to do something like this, not to use private devices. She lied about the number of devices she used. She lied about sending or receiving classified information. But even the simple mishandling of classified information is against the law. Destroying information is against the law. Clearly, with the timeline I just laid out, they were trying to obstruct justice and circumvent the law. How did we get to the point where Comey, in July, let her off the hook? Do you think it might be related to the fact that it implicates the president? No, I, th I think it's because the pressure was put to bear on him by the president and the attorney general in an effort to protect uh, Clinton. Not, I don't think at that stage they thought they were protecting Obama. I thought they were protecting the Democratic nominee. Uh, I think in retrospect, Comey now realizes because of the rebellion in his own uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation that he, he made the wrong decision that was unsustainable. Uh, he got the excuse this week, uh, courtesy of Anthony Weiner, and 650,000 emails to reopen it. And, of course, pe people should not just focus narrowly on the emails. I think the, the five offices that are investigating, and apparently, according to the Wall Street Journal, have been investigating the Clinton Foundation for Corruption for a year. I think that investigation, frankly, is at least as big a deal as the emails. And I think the level of corruption is unimaginable. And I don't think it's sustainable. It's not in the United States. My, my new newsletter is about uh, Hillary Rodham Nixon, because I think she does pose the likelihood, if she were to stumble through to victory next Tuesday, which I doubt, I think that the investigations would grind her up over the next year. What about this new discovery that the person that is responsible now for investigating this and responding to Congress as it relates to this new probe happened to be the defense attorney for John Podesta? You know, you know we said this last night, you can't even write this in your novel and, and yeah. have anybody believe it's, yeah. it's a possibility. If, if I put all these pieces into treason, nobody would have thought it was possible. I, I merely have people who are loyal to ISIS and betray the United States government. This is vastly more complicated than anything I wrote. Uh, but, but, you know, I think that, that Senator Grassley and, and uh, Chairman Goodlatte, the head of the Senate and House Judiciary Committees, should, should, should write 
a letter to the president demanding that a series of people recuse themselves. McCabe, whose wife got $675,000 from Hillary Clinton's ally, the governor of Virginia. He has to recuse himself from all this stuff. I think the, the people in justice who are close to Podesta, they have to recuse themselves from all this stuff. The people who Lynch appointed, as, as Andy McCarthy points out, in the, in the Brooklyn office of the U.S. Attorney, all of whom are loyalists to, to Lynch, who is loyal to Clinton, uh, I mean, this is an absurdity. Uh, and I think that they have to find a way to get independent people, career professionals, uh, to come in and take this apart. And they have to remember that all of these special deals that none of us understood uh, that were involved with you know, uh, not going after the computers, destroying some of the computers by the government. Actually, now it looks like we're in defense of the corruption at the Clinton Foundation, not in defense of the emails. So there's, there's a lot here that, uh, very much like Watergate, you could start seeing people who are in the Justice Department being subjected to uh, criminal procedures against them for their well, obstruction you, you, of justice. I think it's Justice fair to say, Department. You know, yeah, you got the Justice Department putting their hand, uh, Podesta's hand-picked guy that, quote, kept him out of jail uh, in charge of the investigation. Then we've got a report in Politico, the Justice Department is pushing the FBI to finish the email gate probe before the election. How is it, how is it possible, remotely possible, to go through 625,000 emails. Now, the only person that seems to be sticking up on the Democratic Party side that hasn't gone full Ken Starr on James Comey is the president that says he does not believe that James Comey is trying to influence the election. What are your thoughts on that? Is this the big well, separation time? Well, I mean, first, first of all, I thought it was a sign that when the number 650,000 emails came out that the Obama team suddenly went, oops, Maybe we finally go on too far. Uh, he has said a couple of other things, by the way, that begin to kind of distance himself from Hillary. Uh, Governor Rendell, former Democratic National Committee chairman, has also come out and said the FBI is doing the right thing. Senator McCaskill, who's one of Hillary's strongest defenders, said, you know, the FBI had no choice. They have to look into this stuff. You begin to see breaks in the armor uh, because it's indefensible. But, but my point here for the audience is broader. I believe there are people in the Justice Department who are guilty of obstruction of justice, as well as people in the Clinton operation. And I think that we, we may end up with independent counsel. We may end up in a variety of steps. But it, it's intolerable in the United States of America to have people who are government officials who are this incestuous, this involved, and have this gigantic uh, conflict of interest. And All as right. you point out, when somebody's been the defense attorney, he can't be put in charge of the prosecution. No, you can't. Uh, good point. All right, we're going to have more with Newt Gingrich right after this break. Also coming up tonight, WikiLeaks exposes yet again how DNC interim chair Donna Brazile colluding with the Clinton campaign and helping Hillary cheat in her battle against Bernie Sanders. Are his supporters mad? They should be tonight. Newt Gingrich will weigh in on that. Plus, tonight. In a newly released email, John Podesta has been caught saying, we have to dump all of those emails. Can you believe this? That's WikiLeaks. Donald Trump calling out Hillary Clinton and her campaign for her email server scandal. Former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani goes over the law in detail. Coming up straight ahead tonight. It's on lawn service in Germantown. Welcome back to Hannity. Interim DNC Chair Donna Brazile is in big trouble this week. This after WikiLeaks released a new email showing Brazile allegedly giving yet another debate question to the Clinton campaign while she was actively employed by, oh, the Clinton News Network. Now, on March 5th of this year, just one day before a Democratic debate between Clinton and Bernie Sanders, Brazile sent an email to John Podesta and another Clinton aide with the subject line, one of the questions directed to Hillary Rodham Clinton tomorrow is from a woman with a rash in the body of the message. Brazil wrote her family has lead poisoning and she will ask if, what, if anything, will Hillary do as president to help people in Flint, Michigan? Now, after this email was made public, well, CNN announced that Brazil had formally resigned from the network a few weeks ago, but Brazil still maintains her position at the DNC. Why is Hillary not demanding that a person that cheated Bernie Sanders, head of the DNC, is not fired? 
Now, this is not the only instance of Clinton's team colluding with the mainstream media and a member of the DNC. Remember, back in July, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, she was forced to resign from her post as DNC chairwoman after a hacked email showed her calling a top Sanders aide, quote, particularly scummy. And that's not all. The leaked emails also show that DNC staffers, they spoke about using Sanders' Jewish faith against him in West Virginia and Kentucky. So what must Bernie Sanders supporters be thinking? There was also emails that, frankly, I view as kind of racist, misogynistic, and sexist. Back with more reaction. Former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. You know, if Donald Trump had emails from Reince Priebus that were sexist, misogynistic, anti-Semitic, and racist, I think Reince Priebus would be gone and not hired by Donald Trump. Debbie Wasserman Schultz was hired by Hillary Clinton. And then we got this other issue with poor Bernie Sanders. Um, Donna Brazil, the fix was in from the get-go. Trump was right. They totally screwed Bernie Sanders. Your reaction? Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, look I mean, first of all, the, the surprise here is not Clinton. Clinton is corrupt. There's no reason to believe Clinton's going to do anything that involves reforming anything. The fascinating thing is, where's Bernie Sanders? I mean, how can Bernie Sanders sit quietly learning that the Democratic National Committee sabotaged him, learning that the current Democratic National Committee chair was apparently uh, giving questions to Hillary Clinton for his debates with her? Why isn't Bernie Sanders standing up and saying she needs to resign? Uh, it means very, and where are all the Sanders supporters? I mean, these people just got mugged by the Clinton machine, uh, and they're all passive. I mean, I don't see any fight on the left to say, how, how come these things are being allowed to happen? It's, it's a remarkable collapse on the left at a time when the evidence is overwhelming that the nomination was stolen from them. All right, Mr. Speaker, let me switch topics a little bit. I want to go to the polls. You said something on this show last night that I think surprised a lot of people, myself included. And that is, I said, okay, if Donald Trump wins North Carolina, poll had him up seven today, for example, in North Carolina. It's a must-win state, from my perspective, for Donald Trump, as is Florida, as is Ohio, as is Iowa, as is Nevada, and as is every other state that Governor Romney won back in 2012. The question is, how does he get to 270? Now, there's got to be a combination thereof where he gets a blue state. And that means he's also going to have to convert New Hampshire, main second congressional district. If that doesn't work, he'll need the five electoral votes in New Mexico. If that doesn't work, he'll need Minnesota, Michigan, or Wisconsin, or Pennsylvania. And you said to me, I'm wrong. I'm thinking I have conventional, a conventional thought process on electoral votes, and I want to dig deeper into the issue with you and have you explain what you mean. Well, this is actually something that Larry Sabato wrote about a couple of years ago in a book that I found fascinating. And he said, you know, if you think about it, it's not that there's an electoral lock by anybody. If your candidate's vote goes up, it tends to go up across the board, and all of a sudden a lot of states start to fall into place. So I, I mentioned to you on radio today uh, this fascinating report by the, uh, the superintendent of education of Minnesota that Trump beat Clinton among high school students. 77,000 students voted, and Trump won Minnesota. Now, nobody in the country would have guessed that high school students in Minnesota would prefer Trump to Hillary Clinton. It tells you that there's something happening out there. Minnesota could come into play, Wisconsin can come into play, Michigan can come into play, uh, Pennsylvania can come into play, New Hampshire can come into play, uh, New Mexico, Colorado, where I'll be tomorrow, Nevada, where I'll be on Thursday. I mean, all of these things are coming along, uh, and you suddenly realize that he breaks through. I mentioned to you also today that people need to remember, if he's now up one, and who knows, because this is the same poll where eight days ago he was down 12, which was totally stupid, so who knows where he is. But let's say he's up one for a second. She is clearly winning California by a huge margin. California is a huge state. That means if you took California off the table, he's probably nationally up two or th up three or four if he's up one with California included. But what about the specific state polls that we're talking about? Well, I would say that he is, he is potentially competitive at a minimum in the Northern Congressional District in Maine, in New Hampshire, in Pennsylvania, in uh, Michigan, in Wisconsin, 
I believe in Minnesota, despite everybody's thoughts, and this high school poll today kind of bears that out. I think certainly in Colorado, certainly in New Mexico, certainly in Nevada. I forgot Colorado. I mean, you You're certainly right. have a lot of different things in play. You certainly have a lot of places in play uh, that people don't think about. And if, in fact, I mean, a good friend of mine, Matt Towery, who you know is a great person. I pollster, know Matt well, yeah. Good uh, I pollster. sent him the. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I sent him the North Carolina results. He said if he's really up seven in North Carolina, the bottom is falling out of the Clinton campaign. Uh, that's his term. And so I can imagine a circumstance where, as people look at 650,000 emails over here, they look at all of this corruption in the Clinton Foundation over here, they look at all these new WikiLeaks about Podesta, and they just say, I can't do it. I, I have a friend who has a young voter in their family, very liberal, Bernie Sanders supporter, walked in, knew he couldn't vote for Trump, thought he might vote for Clinton. He was voting, uh, early voting. He said, he looked at the ballot and he said, I cannot do it. Skipped the presidency totally and went down ballot. Now, wow. this was a Sanders vote who couldn't vote for Hillary. I also had Sanders a 90-year-old woman robbed. in Woodstock. We had, WikiLeaks exposed it all. <clears throat> exactly. They were robbed blind. The fix was in. All right, but I've got to run. Yeah, By the fact, way, I've got this. I got this. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Trump should probably want to get a, a, an ad that says, if you're a Sanders voter, get even. Don't vote for Hillary. That's a great way to put it. By the way, and they probably agree with Trump on trade and a lot of other issues. This is a Trump pen, and we played it last night. He pushed the head down. I will be the greatest president that God ever created. I ordered a thousand of them today, and I'm going to give them away probably early this, uh, late this week or early next week. Mr. Speaker, appreciate it as always. We'll see you back <laughs> okay. here tomorrow night. I know I can't help myself. It actually worked pretty good. I'm really rich. Okay, one more. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border, and I will have Mexico pay for that wall. That's a pen. I'm going to give them away. Coming up next tonight on Hannity. In a newly released email. John Podesta has been caught saying, we have to dump all of those emails. Can you believe this? That's WikiLeaks. Donald Trump, he calls out Hillary Clinton and her campaign. Up next, former New York City mayor, former prosecutor Rudy Giuliani will weigh in and also tonight. If we don't repeal and replace Obamacare, we will destroy American health care forever. It's being destroyed now. Donald Trump explaining why Obamacare must be repealed and replaced immediately. We'll ask Laura Ingram, who's here later tonight, to weigh in on that and much more straight ahead. Card. In a newly released email, John Podesta has been caught saying, we have to dump all of those emails. Can you believe this? That's WikiLeaks. John Podesta, I tell you what, if he worked for me, I would fire him so fast. He is such a nasty guy. He would, I would fire him like The Apprentice. John, you're fired. Amazing. Nasty guy. And Donna Brazil and Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Let's see. She hires people that help her cheat. She hires people that have emails that are racist and sexist, misogynistic and anti-Semitic. Oh, if it was Donald Trump, I guess they would uh, have to be fired. Anyway, that was more of Donald Trump earlier today talking about the latest WikiLeaks revelations about the Clinton camp. Also tonight, just how much trouble is top Clinton aide Huma Abedin really in? Now, we searched through the State Department Freedom of Information Act archive and found what appears to be a legal agreement signed by Abedin when she left the State Department. It's commonly known as a OF-109. Now, by signing this, Abedin swore that she had turned over all classified documents to the federal government. But as we now know, the FBI is reportedly searching through 650,000 emails found on Anthony Weiner's laptop that could include and contain classified information from UMA. Joining us now with reaction, former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. I actually have it right here. This is the OF-109 that we got. By the way, the rest of the media, you lazy people out there colluding with the Clintons, you could actually do this too. Um, I have it right here. And... Mr. Mayor, it actually has the 18 U.S. Code, all of the issues you brought up, and we'll put them on the side of the screen. <laughs> Uma Abedin, every single one of those, if she has classified material on there, isn't that each one of those a felony? Uh, yeah, uh, each one of them is. And, uh, so you I mean, could have Uma uh, and no Anthony Weiner going I mean, to jail together. There, there's no question 
anymore as to whether or not Hillary Clinton, Aberdeen, Podesta, all these people violated the laws. You have to be almost stupid not to realize it. Uh, the reality is, the thing that is really more shocking is the tremendous cover-up that took place here. The uh, corruption of the Justice Department is, to me, absolutely shocking. The fact that Podesta's lawyer is in charge of this investigation. I thought L Loretta Lynch had recused herself from this case, yet she was telling, uh, she was telling the director of the FBI that he couldn't uh, respond to Congress. Uh, she was refusing to uh, allow a grand jury, or at least her old, her old district, the Eastern District, was refusing to allow a grand jury here. The Justice Department, see, it seems to me, is the one that corrupted this investigation. And, um, and there's got to be a couple of people there that are also uh, going to be liable eventually when this gets investigated. Uh, Clinton, Aberdeen, uh, the people right around them, Pagliano, I mean, these people are so guilty. As I said, you'd have to be stupid not to realize it. Let me put up the WikiLeaks revelation specific to the Clinton email server, because these are important. I mean, WikiLeaks has done two things that I think are, are very important. One, they show that we have no cybersecurity. Two, they expose just how sure. corrupt they are here. We're going to have to dump all those emails. Should we hold back subpoenaed emails of the president and the secretary <laughs> of state? You know, correct me if I'm wrong. You're the former prosecutor. Aren't all those things crimes? Yeah. What it indicates is their first reaction. Their first reaction is to do something criminal. Let's see if we can dump them. Maybe we can't dump all of them. Let's see if we can dump some of them. But not, rather than we have nothing to lose and just putting them all out there because we didn't do anything wrong. It indicates, again, that you would really have to ha well, be mentally inferior not space, to figure so out that That wasn't criminals. an option. They ended up deleting them all. Well, they deleted them all and they, and they bleached them. Yeah. They bleached them, which, which uh, you know, is a pretty sophisticated level of crime. Uh, and now, now she says she wants the emails turned over. Well, Hillary, if you wanted the emails turned over, what would you bleach them for? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about this Department of Justice official who notified Congress that the agency would dedicate all necessary resources uh, to the reopen Hillary Clinton investigation. Well, it turns out that John Podesta, again, thank you, WikiLeaks, referred to him as the guy that saved me from jail. Uh, is that a conflict of interest? Maybe I'm just living uh, uh, in a different 100 world. 100 uh, percent con conflict of interest, just like it was a conflict of, of interest for Cheryl Mills and the other person who got immunity to sit in as a lawyer when Hillary Clinton was being interviewed by the FBI, just like Loretta Lynch, who said she recused herself, her involvement in this is one conflict of interest after another. After her meeting with Bill Clinton four days before the interview uh, at an airport in, I think, Phoenix or Tucson, Ar Arizona. I mean, I could count for you so many conflicts of interest, it would astound you. They have corrupted the Justice Department in a way that uh, I don't ever remember, even in the Watergate days. I mean, the people in the Justice Department resigned when they were asked to do things wrong. Yeah. I'm so ashamed of the Justice Department and their role in this. And, you know, I think part of why Obama defended uh, uh, Comey is he realizes that Hillary Clinton infected his administration with massive corruption. What do you think about the like vote of confidence that Obama gave Comey that he's not trying to well, interfere I think, it was, I, think it's a, I think it's a sign that he realizes that his legacy may be maybe the biggest scandal in the history of this country, bigger than Watergate, bigger than Teapot Dome. You've got so many parts to it, uh, Sean. Yeah. And he's got, connected to it. She uh, dragged uh, him into uh, it. Miss Misuse of uh, confidential, top secret information, jeopardizing possibly the lives of agents uh, in, in, in the field. Then you have a multi million, hundreds of millions of dollar fraud involved with the Clinton Foundation and the State Department. Just the mere fact that Huma Abedin worked for the State Department, the Clinton Foundation, and the Teneo Corporation. Yeah. I don't remember when I was in the Justice Department, somebody having two outside full-time jobs, uh, one of them a complete conflict. Remember, she signed a, a document saying she was going to keep the Clinton Foundation separate, separate. from the State yep. Department. 
So what? So why is her top aide working for right. both? I'm running out of time. Tell me. We're, explain we're, that to me. We're up on a hard break. If you were prosecuting this case based on the information you have now, give me a percent of accuracy that you'd get a conviction. What do you think the odds are that you prosecuting this case would get convictions of high-level officials? I've, I've, won, I've, won, I've won cases much more difficult than this. I, I, would, I never guarantee a victory. I'd come pretty close to saying she Slam can be convicted dunk. under all those statutes. Wow. Yeah, I'd say she could be convicted of all those statutes I gave you uh, yeah. a year ago and now about four more. And then I'd, then I'd put on top of it a racketeering enterprise, Charged. the Clinton Foundation. Wow. Yeah, Clinton Incorporated racketeering enterprise. Well, if they had an Italian name, they'd have been, if they had an Italian name, they'd have been prosecuted already. <laughs> wow. All right, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. And up next tonight on Hannity. If we don't repeal and replace Obamacare, we will destroy American health care forever. Average American didn't keep their doctor, their plan. They're paying $4,100 more than they were paying before. And many states are seeing a 100% increase from last year's premium to this year. Donald Trump laying out the reasons why Obamacare needs to be repealed and replaced. Laura Ingram's next with reaction. Also, Monica Crowley, Larry Elder are here to weigh in on the mainstream media's bias. When Donald Trump becomes president of the United States of America and we reelect strong Republican majorities in Congress, we're going to repeal Obamacare, lock, stock, and barrel. I will ask Congress to convene a special session so we can repeal and replace. And it will be such an honor for me, for you, and for everybody in this country because Obamacare has to be replaced. And we will do it, and we will do it very very quickly. It is a catastrophe. If we don't repeal and replace Obamacare, we will destroy American health care forever. Donald Trump and Indiana Governor Mike Pence earlier today laying out the reasons why Obamacare needs to be repealed and replaced. Here with Reaction, Fox News contributor, editor-in-chief of LifeZet, nationally syndicated radio host, the woman never stops working 24-7, Laura Ingram. Huh. Were you on Fox and Friends today? Uh, only at, you know, 8 o'clock this morning. <laughs> yeah, well, it's fun. You're, you're a rock star. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, get me to 270. Well, I think, uh, Sean, I just, this just broke like four hours ago where they had the list of the increases in Obamacare. Okay, uh, th what percentage increases? This is really critical for the election. I think this is why Trump and Pence today did that speech in Pennsylvania. Check this out, Sean. Forgive me for not memorizing it all, but... Uh, Pennsylvania, 53% increase in Obamacare premiums. Okay, it gets better. Go down to North Carolina, 40% increase in Obamacare premiums. And then keep going. Minnesota, which is, some of the polls there are kind of interesting. If he wins Minnesota, it'll be a blowout, no doubt about it. Minnesota, 59% increase in Obamacare. Go down to North Carolina, where a new poll that came out tonight, seven. Sean, Plus shows that Trump, yeah, Trump's up, as you know. So uh, in, in uh, North Carolina, it's not as bad, but it's still not as bad as 18.9% increase in Obamacare premiums. Yeah, the emails, email scandal is big, because it's about corruption in Washington and corruption with the Clintons. This is a financial disaster for millions of Americans, well, Laura, and this goes right to the pocketbook. People didn't keep Talk their doctors, their plan, and already yeah. the average family pays $4,100 more a year. Okay, yeah. so let's assume he wins Florida, Ohio, North Carolina. I think he'll get those states. Now, I do. Tell, he'll get Iowa. Can, tell me the state that's going to put him over the top. Pennsylvania, well, Minnesota, Michigan, uh, I, Wisconsin, yeah. New Hampshire, New Mexico, Colorado. Which one? I, I think he has a good, I mean, I know North Carolina has gone twice for Obama. It's turned liberal in many ways. But I think well, this North Carolina Obama went to Romney last time. I went, went to Romney the second time, right? Went to Obama the, uh, in 2008. But I think, I think North Carolina is going to go Trump. I think Wisconsin, if, if we got a little bit more united in Wisconsin, if Paul sure, Ryan you know, didn't look like you know, Trump yeah, was the luck. evil stepchild, I, I think that would help a little bit. But... I remember Trump, I think Trump won the, Paul Ryan's district in the, during the primary. I think Trump has a, a, has a decent chance in Wisconsin. I know that's not on a lot of people's radar. And I'm telling you, I think the state of Minnesota is, wow. can be really unpredictable. And remember, a state that has a congresswoman like 
or had a congressman like Michelle Bachman, and then has far left governor Mark Dayton, and then it had Norm Coleman, and, and then it had Jesse Ventura. Ventura. You, you just don't know <laughs> yeah. what Minnesota's going to do, much like Maine, which I know is people say is trending Hillary. And I and I lived it four years in New Hampshire. I still don't believe the state with the license plate that says live free or die is going to yeah. vote for Hillary Clinton, given everything we know. I can't, I, I mean, it would be heartbreaking if New Hampshire decided to go with the Clintons after everything we've learned. By the way, I'm going to send you a dozen of my Trump pens. I will be oh, great. the oh, greatest no. president that God ever created. All right, I okay. ordered a thousand of them to, because everyone, why are you laughing at me? You're not allowed to because, laugh at me. We're friends. That's not allowed. No. Because my, kid, my kids will take them and get in trouble in school because they love Trump. So right, they're going to get really in trouble, get fail. Good. I'm going to send a note saying Uncle Sean says it's okay, okay to have the Trump Perfect. Pen. They're All coming right. to play tennis at your tennis court, Sean. You got a deal. All right, Laura. <laughs> I know you had a long day. Thank you. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow night. Thanks for being with okay, us. Okay, sounds good. All right, bye. And coming up, just seven days left until voters head to the polls. And a new study by the Media Research Center shows just how in the tank how disgustingly in the tank the mainstream media is for Hillary Clinton. Larry Elder, Monica Crowley, they're next. And we'll tell you how you can get your I will be Trump pen. The greatest president that God ever created. He says other things, too. Hannity, only seven days left to stop the Clinton-Obama machine. A new study by the Media Research Center says just how biased, shows how biased the mainstream media really is. Now, since Friday's announcement that the FBI was reopening their probe into Hillary Clinton's email server, well, the study found that ABC, NBC, CBS, well, they were critical of FBI Director James Comey over Hillary Clinton by a ratio of almost three to one. Journalism's dead. Joining us now with Reaction, radio talk show host Larry Elder, Fox News contributor Monica Crowley. Really? They took the whole Ken Starr bait and, and their hook, line, and sinker, and they run with Comey's the problem, as if he created the email server scandal. He's the one that lied. He's the one that used bleach bit. He's the one that used acid. He's the one that, come on. Well, look, Sean, none of this should come as a surprise. For decades, we have known that the mainstream media, particularly national correspondents, particularly White House correspondents, have been biased to the left. Starting in 1960. Pew Research started polling those national correspondents, 94 percent of whom voted for Lyndon Johnson yeah. over Barry Goldwater. So we know that that's the case. What makes this time different, qualitatively and quantitatively, is that we've never seen this level of activism before. And that grows out of not any particular love for Mrs. Clinton. They don't actually like her, but they like she's a liberal and a Democrat. They want to preserve the they, Obama and legacy. They also hate Trump. And there's a hatred and a fear of Donald Trump. Because if Trump comes in, he's going to smash the existing order, and that includes the power and influence of the mainstream media. You know, Larry, to pick up on that, and you've talked right. a lot over the years about media bias, but he blows up the Republican establishment, the Democratic establishment, the media establishment, the globalist establishment. It's all shattered. Because he doesn't give, a, he doesn't care about that old order anymore. <laughs> well, he's not beholden to anybody. One of the uh, things about Donald Trump is he's been able to self-finance for the most part his own campaign. And add to that study, Sean, the WikiLeaks revelation that the Washington Post is doing an article about John Podesta, the chair of the Hillary Clinton campaign, undercovers uh, something about a conflict of interest and says to him, "Don't worry about it. We're going to bury it." New York Times gives Hillary veto proof over quotes she doesn't like. And the moderator of one of the debates, John Harwood, who's both a reporter for the New York Times and an anchor for CNBC, is writing Podesta a letter bragging about how he put Donald Trump on his ears. There's a newspaper in Central Florida, Sean, called the Daily Commercial, and they put out an editorial, and they have apologized to their listeners for their one-sided anti-Trump coverage. Where's the editorial from the Washington Post, yeah. the New York Times, hey, CNBC? Larry, where is it? Larry, <laughs> don't hold your breath. Just a friendly <laughs> advice. Uh, why is Donna Brazil, who cheated... Bernie Sanders and his corrupt and fed questions. Why isn't Hillary asked for her? Why is she supporting a cheater? And why is she supporting and why did she hire Debbie Wasserman Schultz after the racist, sexist, misogynist, anti-Semitic emails were discovered that forced her out of the DNC? Yeah, I mean, it, it really is incredible, the level of collusion. And that's why I say th this election cycle takes the liberal activism on the part of the press to a whole other level. You've been saying journalism is dead for a long time. But I think what Eight we're seeing years. this year, because Trump is such a black swan kind of candidate, that the li that that the mainstream media cannot countenance him. So they have literally done everything they could, including Donna Brazil, right. and helping Mrs. Clinton cheat. Larry, last word. 
Donna Brazile was vice chair when she was feeding questions to Hillary. She did her job, Sean. Her job was to not put her thumb on the scale. Okay, in full disclosure, Blackberry and a Blackberry. I have a, a, a you know, a, an iPad, a mini iPad, an iPhone, and a Blackberry. I believe I have met all of my responsibilities and the server um, will remain uh, private. In order to be as cooperative as possible, we have turned over the server. They can do whatever they want to with the server. I am confident that I never sent nor received any information that was classified at the time it was sent and received. So that leaves the 100 out of 30,000 emails that Director Comey testified uh, contain classified information. I did not receive anything that was marked as classified. Director Comey served Hillary Clinton a subpoena to preserve all emails related to the terror attack. Why then did Podesta write this to Cheryl Mills? Quote, think we should hold emails to and from the President of the United States? And why just a few days later, March 7th, after President Obama said he first learned about the server from journalists, from the news, why did Cheryl Mills email this, quote, we need to clean this up. He has emails from her, and they don't say state.gov. Now, after being blindsided by the discovery of the private email server, it sounds like the campaign was quickly realizing how big a problem they had on their hands, which may then explain what happened next. According to the FBI's report on Clinton's server, just weeks later, a release instead of dump. And if we're going to be totally honest here, can you really take the Clinton campaign at their word about anything or any of this? After all, Hillary Clinton has changed her story about the use of a private server so many times. How can you believe any of this? Watch this. The laws and regulations in effect when I was Secretary of State allowed me to use my email for work. That is undisputed. It clearly wasn't the best choice. Um, and I take responsibility for that decision. I thought it would be easier to carry just one device for my work and for my personal emails instead of two. iPhone or Android? <laughs> iPhone. Just two days before she was served with a congressional subpoena. Now, on March 2nd, pay close to the attention to the timeline. 2015, the same day the world first found out about Clinton's use of a private email server when she was Secretary of State, Clinton's campaign manager, John Podesta, and her campaign manager, Robbie Mook, they exchanged emails about how they were completely caught off guard by the discovery. And then 30 minutes later, Podesta sent this email to top Clinton aide, Cheryl Mills, quote, we're going to have to dump all those emails, so better to do it now sooner than later. Our own Jennifer Griffin asked the Clinton campaign about the email, and they are claiming that dump meant to release. Okay, if that's the case, then why didn't Podesta just say? He said that only three out of 30,000 had anything resembling classified markers. You were the official in charge. Did you like the service? What, like with a cloth or something? No, well, no. We turned over everything that was work-related. Every single thing. Uh, no, they didn't turn over everything. And by the way, it wasn't with a cloth. It was with bleach bit. Basically, they acid washed it. Now, for a minute, I know just for a minute, let's put aside Hillary Clinton's problem with telling the truth. Now, if the Clinton campaign really wants you to believe by saying dump, they meant release, then why did they eventually delete 33,000 of those emails? And if they were emailing about transparency and making the emails public, then why on March 4th, the same day, the Benghazi Select Committee